Uh, welcome to Crossing the Bridge, Connecting Rails in Your Front End Framework. Uh, my name is Daniel Spector, and uh, my hope out of this presentation is that you discover patterns and the best practices um, for integrating Rails and JavaScript. Right, so a lot of times, uh, this is what you see, or the slides cut off a little bit? We can't lower it down? Okay. Huh. All right, then I guess you're gonna have to hear me more, less reading. It's all good. Uh, so, this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, a, my presentation skills, obviously. Uh, but B, uh, you know, terrible bridges. And this, instead, we want this, right? I'm from Brooklyn, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and so when you're integrating JavaScript and Rails, you wanna make that seamless bridge, right? That seamless connection. All right, so this is our game plan. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna understand the trade-offs that you're gonna make. Choosing to use a client-side MVC framework is not without its challenges, and so it's important to understand that before going in. Uh, next, we're gonna look how to deeply integrate your framework with Rails, and when we're gonna do that, we're gonna explore different patterns, different ways of sharing data in a consistent and maintainable way so they can use it to best effect. Uh, so this is me, what's cut off at the top is my name. Uh, my name is Daniel Spector. I am a software engineer at a company called LifeBooker in Brooklyn. I am a graduate of the Flatiron School, and then uh, at LifeBooker, we do Rails, JavaScript, primarily uh, Ember. I also was involved in a lot of mobile development, so have some Swift experience, and we're recently moving over to Clojure. Uh, but enough about that. What are you about to get yourself into, right? This is JavaScript. Um, it is often messy. <laughs> Nobody will say that uh, it is a beautiful, coherent language. Um, it's gotten a little bit better with the new syntax, but still you're gonna run into difficulties. Uh, this, I, th I think, is kind of the general, um, relatively applicable. This is courtesy of Alex Machiner. He's an uh, Ember uh, JS core team member. It is generally easier uh, to write an app, uh, at least especially in the beginning, writing in Rails, having HTML being served up instead of a client-side JavaScript MVC framework. Right? And it's important to always think about the bigger picture. Understand the technical challenge that goes into something is really, really, is really important. You don't wanna think about something, you know, have a great new idea, then dive right into the implementation. What's the best way we could put this in? How can we use it? What are the features? All that. It's really important to understand, before you do that, take a step back, think about the trade-offs, right? And you will encounter a lot of trade-offs. So this is some of the fun that might await you. Uh, you will encounter duplicated models, right? Separate code bases. If, you, if your user has to change something on the Rails side, you're gonna have to change it on the JavaScript, right? And it, it gets often very messy. And just overall complexity in general, you don't know when you're debugging whether often you're looking at a client-side problem or whether you're looking at a server-side problem. Um, and when I talk to people about this, I usually get like, you know, some, uh, this kind of objection, right? That like my customers and my clients, they, this, this is what they need. They want this kind of experience. This is absolutely what, they, uh, what, what, what they're requiring. The truth is, uh, not really, right? Clients, customers uh, care about really one thing, one thing only, or you know, three things, I guess, if you, you know, count the commas as separate bullet points. Maintainable, sustainable, performant applications, period, right? It should be maintainable. Your developer should be able to understand it easily. This should be sustainable. Things should be able to be de debugged, right? And it should be relatively well performant. Um, and if you're not careful, you can run into a lot of gotchas when it comes to client-side MVC frameworks. And you don't wanna run into a case that you have you know, problems with this and you're not delivering the, what's best for your clients and for your customers. Uh, but now that you have been warned, you can make, oh, <laughs> the, top, the top of that is a, uh, a blurred out curse word, but anyways, you can make incredibly awesome applications uh, with client-side MVC frameworks. I'd venture to guess that a large portion of this room uses Gmail on a daily basis. Uh, that is a single page app. Uh, if, you, if you really want, you can scroll to the bottom and click basic version to get the HTML with the full page refresh and all that jazz, uh, but nobody does that. All right? Client side MVCs can make some incredible applications, and especially if you are very graphics heavy, very charts heavy, things like that, things with a lot of really complex user interactions, then it may absolutely be the case that you should, your first choice should be a client side framework. Uh, but just understand that, you know, there are trade-offs, so that says recap on top that's being cut off. Um, never lose sight of your ultimate goal, right? Your ultimate, your ultimate goal is to provide the absolute best experience that you can for your users. Understand the trade-offs that you're gonna have, um, but we're gonna explore a couple different ways where there may be a solution, right? There, there may be a way to mitigate some of these problems to create better applications. All right, so let's dive right in. We are going to create the absolute simplest version of to-do MVC on Rails. 
Uh, to do MVC is a uh, website where you're able to see the same application implemented in different JavaScript frameworks, so you can really get a nice comparison to it. Uh, the reason it's doing that is because very often the frameworks look completely different, and the ones that we're going to be talking about, uh, they really do. So in terms of, you know, there's going to be a lot of code. Hopefully it won't get too cut off, uh, so, you know, we should be okay with that. Uh, but what's, you know, it's nice to keep a reference so that, you know, it's kind of consistent what we're going to do um, step by step. So this is what we're going to be looking at. Um, we're going to be looking at Angular, we're going to be looking at Ember, and finally React. And so we're going to, these uh, uh, um, implementations are relatively complete. If you follow the slides and slide share, and then you should be able to implement these applications simply as you see them. Uh, but what's important, though, to focus on is the patterns. We're going to explore different patterns of how we're going to connect these, how we're going to share um, data between Rails and, Java, uh, and our JavaScript, and so really focus on you know, how this is implemented. All right, so let's get started. This is Angular. Angular is developed by Google. Um, it has two-way data binding very much at its core. Uh, you know, th when your model changes, your view changes. When your view changes, your model changes. You don't have to write any of the glue code for that. Uh, dependency injection, it's kind of built into a heart of it also. We'll see that in a second. Uh, but Angular 2 is coming. Uh, this is something that you should be aware of. Uh, Angular 2 is not really the same framework as Angular 1. Um, it, is, it is completely different, both from syntax-wise, both from a philo philosophical point of view. Uh, and so it's not like Angular 1's going away. There are thousands of applications at this point built on Angular. Uh, but you should absolutely be aware that if you're starting a project right now in Angular, there's a good chance that in 12 to 18 months, uh, Google's not going to support it anymore. <laughs> and so really think about that before you do choose to do it. But if you are, we can jump right in. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get our Rails project API ready. Like I said, this is going to be very basic. OK, not too much is cut off. So we have um, an index method. We have an, you know, an index and a create, so basically two endpoints. We're going to namespace everything under slash API slash todos. And all, you know, any get request to slash API slash todos is going to give us all of our todos. And then we're going to be able to create new ones. Does that work? There we go. So, uh, the, different, the other frameworks that we're going to be talking about actually have uh, official implementations with uh, Rails, but since Angular doesn't, um, we're, going to have, we're going to try out Bower. Now, when you're including JavaScript uh, frameworks or libraries in general, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can include it with Rails, right? You can use a CDN. It's a perfectly valid option. Uh, you can copy everything into vendor assets. Very often, there will be gemified versions of libraries, which is simply just you know, a nice asset pipeline uh, helper to get uh, the JavaScript in. But we're going to take a look at, at Bower. And Bower it makes it really, really easy to include pretty much any JavaScript library that you want in your code. Um, it's one centralized location for all the packages, and there are thousands of them in there. It integrates real, really nicely via the Bower Rails gem. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, you have to make sure that you have actually Bower on your system. So you just make sure that you, know, you npm install that. And then all you do is you set up in your gem file, Bower Rails, you initialize it, and now you have a Bower file. Very similar to a gem file. Instead of gem, it's asset. And so we're going to bring an Angular and a couple of optional libraries. So how do we manage our client-side data? Right, this is an Angular-specific question. So we could go, you know, just use standard, really jQuery um, Ajax calls back and forth. Angular actually has, it's just really a, a very basic wrapper that it uses around, uh, Ang around I'm sorry, jQuery's uh, Ajax library. But instead, we're going to use Ang Resource. Um, and uh, Ang Resource is in, well, we'll read it to you since you can't see it, um, an optional library that maps basic CRUD actions to specific method calls. Uh, so we're going to scaffold out a very basic application uh, so you can kind of see how it's going to look, and we'll talk about it more from there. So this is Angular. Um, this is the, kind of the entry point that you'll see, right? We're going to call this uh, to do. And with the, you see we're including any resource and any route. This is an example of the dependency injection that Angular has. And then we just do a little CSRF magic to make it work with Rails. And then we have one route. Uh, it's the root route. And we're going to inject the to-do controller into that. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up a factory to hold our resource. And then we're going to pass that factory over and inject it into the controller, which is going to bind it to the template. All right. So this is what our factory looks like. Okay, it's a bit cut off at the top, but you can kind of get the gist of it. Um, we're gonna, everything is going to live under slash API slash to dos, and so this is going to tell us, you know, this, every time we make a call, this is the endpoint that's going to hit. And then we, and then we have our controller, and this controller is all about what you don't see under the hood is the data binding that comes here, 
right? So on instantiation, we're gonna call scope.todos, which is just gonna query a get request for slash API slash todos. It's gonna have one function called add to do. All it's gonna do is gonna grab out that model um, and save it, which is gonna make a post. And then it's gonna requery and it's gonna clear out that model. Um, so the first thing you mentioned, the first thing that you'll notice is that there's no glue code. We'll see the template in a second. Uh, but we're not, you know, manually going into the DOM, updating the views and things like that. Two-way data binding is gonna make sure this all stays in sync. Um, the second thing that's, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The second thing that's important to note is that it's relatively compact. Uh, Angular is uh, relatively simple, and so if you're writing, uh, especially smaller applications, uh, this is kind of all that you need to get set up, right? And now this is what the template looks like. We just uh, ang repeat the user directive to iterate over those to-dos. Uh, and then on submit, we're just gonna call our function. Uh, and this is, you know, this is what, uh, this is what makes it really nice. But there's a, there's a kind of a hidden problem here that it, you know, we'll, we'll, might, might give you pause. If I go back to this for a second, right now all we're doing is calling to do dot query, right? And that's, for this specific application, all we need is just to make a get request for those to do's. But let's say you had a little more complexity and large applications will have a lot of complexity, right? So let's say that you need to first understand, well, is a user logged in? If that user is logged in, then I need their to do's. But maybe I only want the ones that are completed. Maybe I have, you know, a whole bunch of things that I need to understand. It's very likely that you can make a whole bunch of API calls simply before you're rendering out anything uh, to your user. And so that you know, results in a lot of animators, right? You see the loading bars, uh, you know, a little spinner there. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't make for the greatest user experience. Um, and especially because, so we're, I, I think all of us are kind of used to really fast broadband connections, um, but not all your users will be. And so on a really fast connection, you won't even notice the lag. Uh, but, on a, but on a slower connection, you absolutely will. And for usability, for a user standpoint, it could be uh, very tricky. Like nobody wants to go to the page and the first thing they see is just a loading bar that they never know is gonna stop. So this is what it's gonna look like and pretty much in all the implementations, this is exactly uh, what it's, you know, this is exactly what we're doing. So just to recap, uh, data binding Angular, very powerful, right? There was no view glue code. There was nothing that we needed to make sure that bound, that worked, you know, it, it came together. Uh, if you're gonna be using Angular, I'd highly recommend Ang Resource. Uh, or a wrapper around that. There's one specific for Rails if you'd like. Uh, this just makes your request really easy, uh, that you don't have to write out you know, a whole bunch of dollar sign Ajax, the data, the method, and all that. It makes it really easy to use. But here's the problem. Here's the pattern that we need to solve. These multiple API calls to initialize your application get really tricky. And this is gonna be, this is the problem that we're gonna try to solve. And we're gonna try to make, figure out a way to, um, make those you know, a little bit easier to work with and make the experience for your users a bit better. Let's talk about Ember. <laughs> um, Ember was created by Tom Dell and Yehuda Katz, who may be in the room at the moment. Uh, Ember was made for large, ambitious applications. Ember is big. Uh, there's a lot to it, there's a lot, there's a lot of complexity to it, but the, the reason that it's there is because you need that kind of complexity when it comes to large applications. Uh, and so for managing the structure of that, for working it all together, it works really, really nicely. Uh, Ember favors convention over configuration. Um, and Ember, Ember has a, a client-side persistence library called Ember Data, and it works wonderfully. Uh, if you've ever tried to write one on your own, it is horrible. Uh, it is a really tricky problem to get right, and I, I think they knock it out of the park. They did a really great job in making this really easy to work with. So, Ember CLI is the new standard for working with Ember applications. There's a couple talks tomorrow, uh, one on Ember CLI Rails and one on React Rails that uh, will really dive into the, you know, really dive into this. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on the specifics of Ember CLI, but it is, you know, this, if you're getting started with an, with an Ember application, this is absolutely what you should be using. It integrates really nicely via the Ember CLI Rails gem. So we're gonna switch it up a little bit. Instead of just having to-dos, we're gonna introduce the concept of a user. Right? and a user will have many to-dos, and then just assume, again, this is, you know, this is really for demonstration purposes, assume by the time that you hit this controller and how you're gonna get to it is via uh, you know, your Ember controller, assume by this time we have a concept of a current user, and that current user has to-dos, right? So now this is what we're gonna get set up. We're gonna need, obviously, Ember CLI Rails. We're also gonna need Active Model Serializers. Active Model Serializers will work really, really nicely with Ember, and will make it a lot easier. So we're just gonna generate our serializer. 
you know, set it up with embed IDs uh, at the top there. And then this is what it's gonna look like, and it's important to understand this structure. This is actually very basic. There's only one resource. There's a lot of complexity that it could handle. But at its heart, there's gonna be a root element, right, of to-dos, and then everything under that. So this is what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to, instead of using JSON calls at instantiation, right, so when Ember loads, instead of making a bunch of JSON calls to kind of figure out what's going on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna preload Ember with that information, right? Why are we gonna do this? Uh, first things first, uh, we wanna minimize round trips to the server. We don't want, uh, you know, first, you know, we gotta go to Rails, get the HTML, request the JavaScript, then I gotta figure out a bunch of stuff before that. There's a lot of round trips that happen, um, and this will make it a lot easier for our users. And that's really what, what the point about this is, right? If you're preloading this data, if you're loading this data into Ember before it gets, before it gets there, you're not gonna see your loaders, you're not gonna see your automated spinners, and none of that, and ultimately you're gonna have a better experience. Uh, and that's really what's key. So uh, we're in this, uh, you can't really see, but we're in the same controller that we were before. I titled it very creatively, the Ember controller. Um, but so we're gonna grab our to-dos, and then we're gonna call preload. Um, and preload is going to set up an array, and it's gonna just do a little you know, magic just to prepare our data, and then pass it to the active model serializer, or the array serializer, to uh, grab it all out. Now you can use this, now you can use this preload method everywhere in your application if you want, assuming it's going through the request cycle at start. So I can call preload on my to-dos, I can call preload on whatever other resources that I have. Once it's there though, this, we're gonna have this very, you know, we're gonna have this preload variable, and then we're gonna pass it to Ember via the window object. Um, and so we're gonna set up this window.preload Ember data, and then we're gonna just call to JSON on everything that's in there, and it's gonna be an array of arrays. Uh, and then render out, um, render out Ember. I saw this pattern, uh, I believe at first it was used by Discourse before they were on Ember data, um, but there's an open source anime application uh, called Hummingbird that did this really nicely, and so I've adapted it for my own applications. So let's get set up with our client-side code. Uh, first things first, you gotta initialize, uh, you know, Ember CLI, just has, you know, one config file. By convention, I'm gonna call it front end, keep it at the root, and then I'm just gonna generate, um, you know, a new Ember application. And now we're gonna set up two things, so the command on the top is actually important. We're gonna generate a resource of to-dos. Once we generate a resource of to-dos, that's gonna set us up with a model, uh, a route, and an index, and I'm sorry, and a template. Then we're gonna need an adapter, and then we're gonna need a serializer. So this is what Ember looks like. Uh, this is gonna be our model. It's gonna have one attribute, uh, our to-do, you know, it's gonna have a name, which is just a string. And what's important here is that we're gonna use a specific adapter. Now, Ember, uses, Ember data uses adapters to communicate from the client side to the server side. And it comes with a bunch of them. There's the fixture adapter for tests, the LS adapter for uh, local storage. Uh, but default though, the JSON adapter uh, is called the REST adapter. And that's what you generally use. However, Ember helpfully also ships with the active model adapter, which integrates perfectly with um, active model serializers. And if you're using Rails and you're using active model serializers, you absolutely should use the active model adapter. It makes working with it really, really nice and easy. And this is, the fun and this is what we're gonna set up. This is gonna live, you can see at the top, at, at slash initializers slash preload.js. And so very much like Rails, you can set up initializers in Ember. And what we're gonna do is on initialization of Ember, we're gonna first make sure that this is coming after our Ember, sto Ember data store has, uh, has instantiated. Ember data store is where all, everything is really kept by Ember data. And then we're just gonna iterate through that window object and we're gonna push it into the store. And this is gonna load up you know, on initialization. What's great about this now is that we're gonna initialize Ember data objects and it's gonna infer based on that root element, so based on to do's, by convention it's gonna understand that now it's gonna push all these into the to do model. And what's amazing now about this is that it's all there now. We don't have to do anything. So we're just gonna set up a router to have, you know, set up our resources, our route now, and you're gonna see a lot by Ember code, uh, this.store.find model, right? So ordinarily you see this.find.store to do, which would make an API called a slash API slash to do's. Instead though, we're just gonna call all. We're gonna tell Ember data, give me everything that's in the uh, cache right now, because essentially we've pre-cached all, all, uh, all the, you know, the attributes that we need, all the models that we need, and then we can just render it out. And now we just have our template, uh, iterate over it, and display the names. Um, and this is really, really powerful, because now that whole concept of, of spinners and loading bars and all that, it's gone. And it's amazing, right? So don't fight Ember. Use conventions like Atomal Serializers. 
um, preloading is extremely powerful. It simply makes for a better experience for your users. It means that we don't have initial page load uh, you know, for spinners. We don't have those loading bars. It means that your users, when they go to your application, especially in slower connections, they see it, and it's there. And then after that, do the regular client-side stuff. Make that first interaction with your application the best experience it can be. Finally, uh, let's talk a little bit about React. Uh, so React was developed by Facebook, uh, and it has a completely different way of, of reasoning about um, how this all works. So instead of two-way data binding, which I should mention Ember does as well, uh, there's one-way data binding. And so when something ch the model has understa understands that something has changed, everything re-renders. Okay, actually not. Um, it would have to re-render. Uh, um, instead, it keeps a virtual DOM. And the virtual DOM is essentially kept by React, and it'll do a diff. Right, so it'll have a virtual DOM, it'll know that things will change. It'll diff that with your actual DOM that's running in your browser, and it'll just go in there and change what it needs to. It's really efficient, it works really well, and it kind of solves the problem of you know, this data binding issue. Well, the most important thing that it kind of leads us to, and the, the final pattern that we're gonna look at, is isomorphic JavaScript. Isomorphic JavaScript is this uh, buzzword, I guess you could say, that simply means rendering your JavaScript on either the client or on the server. And because React has a virtual DOM, it doesn't need to use that to diff. It could use that to render. And so we're gonna, we're gonna see a pattern now of using React to render, instead of just passing JSON data to the client side, right? Let's just render it straight from the server. Um, instead of making, you know, instead of going through all those initial API calls, we're spitting out HTML at this point. Uh, the first time I saw this in terms of React Rails implementation was a blog post by a guy named Ben Smithit. Uh, and helped me out a lot in terms of this initial implementation. So this is what our controller looks like now. Um, our controller now is gonna pass a hash, um, at least on the index, uh, and it's gonna have a to-dos, which is just gonna be all the to-dos, and then some form elements which we're gonna need to implement with, uh, with Rails. I imagine in the future with React Rails Gem, this is gonna be a bit easier uh, in terms of the form stuff, but we still need all that CSRF protection and uh, you know all that jazz. So this is our gem file. We have React Rails in there, we just install it, and we're kind of off to the races. So the, the first thing that React Rails gives us uh, is this view helper. This view helper, um, yeah, you can see the whole thing, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna call the to-dos component to render out, and you know, we're gonna pass in a proper, you know, the property of that load uh, JSON, so we're gonna call to JSON on that element, which is really just holding our to-dos and the form stuff. But the magic, though, is in pre-render true. Pre-render true is all you need to do to render now on the server, and it's done. And it means then when React serves it, it's gonna serve it as HTML. The magic behind it is that it uses unobtrusive JavaScript, so it's gonna mount some data components, then React is gonna take it over, but it works really nicely, right? And React itself is built around components. Um, components should have one isolated level of responsibility. If your components are a thousand lines long, I mean, unless you're doing something crazy, you're doing something wrong. Uh, everything should be really small, really modular, and it's nice because then when something goes wrong, it's usually really easy to debug and figure out exactly where that came from. So this is going to be our to-do list components. Sorry that the top is cut off. Um, Re React has a concept of props, properties, and uh, state. Props are passed into the component and are immutable. State is managed internally by the component and is mutable. So at the top there, we're calling a function called getInitialState. And all that's doing is just parsing out the props that are, that are coming in so that they're available for the component to use. We're gonna have one function called new to do. Uh, and all that's gonna do, we're gonna, again, we're just gonna pass that down. You're gonna pass a lot of things to different components in React. Um, and that's gonna be the, some of the logic that the component needs in order to handle what happens when you have a new to do. And finally, have the render function. Uh, the render function is, is the only required function that you have in your React components. And what you see here looks a lot like HTML. Uh, in truth, though, it's not. Uh, this is what's called JSX. JSX is an optional, uh, an optional file extension, I guess you can say, that allows you to specify your views in what looks like HTML but isn't actually. So this is really just JavaScript code when it gets rendered out. Uh, but now I'm setting up my div, I'm going to list, and I'm going to create two components out of this. I'm going to have my to-dos list component, which is going to hold the actual list, and I'm going to have the, uh, the, the form, and I'm going to pass into those the properties that it will need to you know, do what it needs to do. So let's take a look at the to-dos list component first. Uh, all this is gonna do is just map over those to-dos those to that were passed in, and then it's gonna create another component out of each of those called the actual to-do component, 
uh, which is just going to be a list item. Again, very small, very modular. It really does make your code easy to work with. It's an investment up front, but if you do it this way, and, you know, st something breaks, you'll be able to identify it really quickly. And now the form. Uh, and so the form, I'm sorry that it's kind of cut off at the sides over there, but essentially all it is is just one function called handle submit, which then handles what has been passed into it once you know, the form data is actually serialized and things like that. Uh, and then the form just you know, does a little magic again with CSRF protection, uh, protection under the hood and is able to post. And this is it. This is the same you know, to-do list that, uh, that we saw before. What's amazing about this, though, is that it's all rendered on the server. We had, didn't have to do any, so forget about you know, loading to get initial data. Everything at this point is straight HTML. Everything at this point has been rendered out, right? So each component only should have one responsibility. Don't make your components massive. Don't make them do a whole bunch of stuff. Keep them really small. It makes it really nice and easy. Uh, Pre-render on the server. We didn't even talk about some of this, but SEO. Right? Google can't really, ca can't really crawl heavy JavaScript applications. But for SEO purposes, this is a huge win because your initial page load is gonna be straight HTML. This is crawlable in a second now. Um, usability, right? especially from, for accessibility uh, points. For users who are on slower connections, this is an, you know, rendering this on the server side is gonna be an, a huge win for you. Right? And again, I, I need to stress that we don't really consider these because a lot of us have very fast connections and those initial ones are, you know, it seems kind of, you know, instantaneous. And you're thinking to yourself, why is this such a problem? If you're on a slower connection and your users are gonna be on slower connections, um, it's, it is, becomes a problem. It does become a problem. And so you use the magic, right? Use the magic of UJS, which, which makes, in React at least, this, re, this is really nice and easy. It renders out from the server the, as HTML, the component will pick it up, and then it'll do all its magic from there. And this, I think, is the, the final pattern and what, what we're gonna come to. Uh, isomorphic JavaScript is the future. Doing this has so many benefits, I can't think of a good reason not to. Um, React has this obviously built in. Ember 2.0 is going to have fast boot, which is gonna do something very similar. And Angular 2, um, I, can't, I, I haven't seen specifically, that they're gonna enable server-side rendering, but the way that it's currently being structured and it's currently being built, I can imagine that this won't be an option for you. So this is kind of where we've come from and where we're going, right? Initially, our application starts up, we make a bunch of API calls, there's a lot of loaders, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that have to be rendered, and in general, especially in slower connections, it's not the best experience for your users. So, you know, of one implementation is to just preload that data, pass it via the window object, pass all the JSON over. We still have the problem of crawlability. We still have a problem of, of you know, accessibility. But at least we don't see that, you know, those animated you know, GIFs just going round and around. But if we can server-side render, why not, right? Why not make it your, your sites have SEO? Why not make it that you know, you're, you're have providing a great experience for a user? And I think this is really what's key, and I, I'm pretty confident that the future of JavaScript uh, client-side MVCs, which do have some amazing benefits, will be this, will be that initial service ed vendor. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you wanna tweet at me or get in touch in any other way, uh, please feel free. And uh, that's my Twitter, that's my blog, and yeah, thank you so much for your time, I really appreciate it. Guy <laughs> okay, over there. Uh, I think those are, I think, those are the benefits. I think in, in, from an experience of your users, right, and they don't necessarily care. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, the question was whether there are any other benefits for using server-side rendering v, uh, versus SEO or usability. Um, and I think, I, to be honest, to me, that, that's a great reason for it. I don't see the drawbacks, right? I don't see the reason why you wouldn't necessarily start server-side rendering. I don't think you lose anything. Um, and I think that the, you know, the, the frameworks like Ember 2.0 is gonna have this really easy for you to work with if that's something that you are interested in. Um, and it just, especially, it's, it, the connection is also, is also uh, um, something that's really big. Uh, Tom Dale, he, he, wrote, he wrote a bit of a blog post about this where he couldn't understand why Twitter had switched over to server-side rendering, at least on first initial load. Um, and it was because for, you know, for a lot of users, it's really fast, they don't even notice it. But for people on slower connections, it's actually, it, you know, becomes a really big challenge for that. And you wanna make, especially that initial one, uh, as best as possible.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the question was uh, about uh, Gone. Gone is a gem that you can use to pretty much do what I did um, automatically. Uh, the reason that I did it in this particular context is because I wanted to show the integration with Ember Data, how that can work really, really nicely. But if you simply want to pass objects to your JavaScript framework, and again, this will work for Backbone as well, uh, really nice and easily, check out the Gone gem. Uh, then whatever you set in your controller on the Gone object will be available in window, you know, dot Gone, and then you could, you know, pass arrays, you could pass, you know, active model records, active, active record, active model records as, uh, you know, as JSON and things like that. Yeah, I've used it before. It works really nicely. Yeah, I mean, I've used Brombone. Like, Brombone is a service, though. It's something that you're paying for monthly. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, so the, the question was that it is an alternative to um, render, to you know, doing pre-rendering for SEO. There are services like prerender.io, like Brombone, that will handle this for you. Uh, and that's absolutely the case. Uh, but then again, it's a service that you're paying for, right? You're paying additional money to have your website crawlable by uh, Google. Uh, that's something that I'd like, you know, kind of be able to do on my own. Um, you know, Brombone, you know, I have, I, to be honest, I haven't heard of prerender.io, but I imagine it costs, you know, something similar to that. And so it's not cheap. And so if I'm building, if I'm building an MVC or if, it, you know, I'm building something that I want to validate, I don't want to have to pay some monthly cost to make sure that, you know, my website's crawlable by as many people as possible. So the question was that React um, is, React is very small, right? React is really just a view layer. Um, the question was whether you can use that kind of small component base to, gener to generically uh, introduce into your application with Angular and Ember. Uh, with Angular, yes. With Angular, all you really need is a div that you'd specify where that renders out. Uh, I apologize, some of it was cut off, but there's a declaration on top of that template that shows you where, uh, where it's actually being injected. So if you, if you put on the HTML tag on top, it'll be your entire application. Uh, but if you, wanted, if you want to use Angular in just one div on your application, you absolutely can. It, it's very easy. Uh, Ember, not so much. Um, Ember, again, I could be contradicted by the, uh, <laughs> by the creators in this room, but Ember, Ember takes over. Ember will take over your, uh, your application. It's much harder to use small components of Ember. Uh, you really, uh, you'd really have to work at that. But for Angular, absolutely. Right, so, so what I left off of the, all these slides is that, so the question was, um, what are you going to do if your, well, your application is tightly coupled, which it seems like, from your front end to your back end? Um, and so what I left off of these slides is that what, what you're assuming here is that you're serving these frameworks out of your Rails applications. When you're starting up, when you're, you know, riding the monorail, uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, but often a lot of companies, mine included, will split off into, you know, various APIs to, you know, manage that completely separately. Those, you know, if they're serving JSON, those don't even have to be uh, Rails applications. Ours most, you know, are, are starting to not be. Um, so what, what we've chosen to do is we render, we use Rails on the, on the front end, right? So we're using Rails um, to, you know, process that front end. What it needs, to, when it needs to, it calls out to the server to grab all the data, um, and then it renders out Ember from that Rails template. But yeah, if, if, it, if it is, you know, completely separate and you're only running Angular and you're only, or, you know, what, whichever one, you're only running the server, then, um, you know, I would definitely encourage you to use um, you know, it's not like, you know, Ember Data has, you know, really nice in terms of making that transition as easy as possible. But yeah, you're, for instance, you're not going to be able to pass anything via the window object or anything like that. So that is the general concern. Yep. Which one would you pick? Which one would I pick? Uh, the, I, it's, <laughs> I don't want to start any wars here. Uh, I saw a couple of people walking in with spears before. It was, you know, very intimidating. Um, everything has a different use case. Uh, for large applications, I would choose Ember. I think that it, it is, I've worked with it a lot. It's really nice to work with, uh, but it's, for, it's really for large, ambitious applications. Uh, they make that very clear on the site. If uh, you're using something small at this point, I would choose React. Uh, and again, like React is, a view, is really just a view layer. Um, there's application architectures around React to kind of you know, integrate it and make it work really well. Uh, but I, I, I would probably focus on those two, and mainly you know, because you don't, when it, comes, in, when it comes to this syntax for Angular at least, this is gone. This, these slides are going to be obsolete when Angular 2 comes along. Um, and so I wouldn't, if I'm starting a project today, I wouldn't put myself into a, a you know, deprecation mode uh, at onset at least. Anybody else? No? Well, thank you so much for your time, everybody. I really appreciate it. <laughs>